A while back, at the end of October, when I finished my yearly countdown of the best in horror, I promised to list the 13 most disappointing films of 2022. Well, better late than never, I guess. Here are the films that really let me down over the last year. I'm sure there are more. I see a lot of bad ones, but sometimes I go in with such high expectations or just wishful thinking that I end up getting burned in the end. Here are those films. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below, share this video with all of your social media addicted pals, click subscribe to this channel, and ring that bell for notifications. Here's a list of the 13 most disappointing horror films I saw in 2022. I've included where you can find these films if you're looking to punish yourselves for some reason. This list is in chronological order by release date. Does it count that a film turned me off so much from its trailer that I didn't even bother attempting to see it? I guess not. But still, having seen The Invitation show up on quite a few of Critics' Worst of the Year lists, I'm glad I didn't see this film. I honestly have nothing against any of the filmmakers or stars in it. What turned me away from it was the trailer which revealed almost the entire story from start to finish, surprises and all. If I were the filmmaker, I'd be super pissed that basically the trailer is a truncated version of my movie. Seems there was a reason they gave the movie away in the trailer. I guess it wasn't worth seeing in long form. I might catch it someday, but I still have no desire to see The Invitation, and I'll just keep this one here as an honorable mention and a warning to those in the ad department to do the opposite of this in order to get people to actually go see your movie. The Requin aka From Below, was released on January 22nd, 2022, and is streaming on Hulu. It's directed and written by Lee Van Keet. Whew. We're starting with a true stinker. Apparently this film, pitting Alicia Silverstone against a giant shark, is based on a true story, but it's highly doubtful it went down like this. On a dream vacation in Vietnam, sure, Silverstone and her hubby stay on one of those floating vacation homes and decide to stay in it in the middle of a hurricane, sending the entire home floating off into the ocean. When the home begins to fall apart, the couple have to fight to stay afloat and out of a shark's hangry mouth. As ludicrous as a concept this is, the most arduous thing to endure with the Requin is Silverstone's acting. Her incessant whining and even more unappealing grunting exposed Silverstone's weakest thespian aspects, making her an utterly unappealing character. Add in some over-the-top and inexplicable action sequences towards the finale, and you've got an absolute groaner of a film. Dark Glasses, a.k.a. Ochali Neri, was released on February 4th, 2022. It's streaming on Shudder. It's directed by Dario Argento and written by Dario Argento and Franco Ferrini. Dark Glasses is not an absolutely horrible movie. It's not as bad as Dario Argento's Dracula by a long shot. But still, the Dario Argento we all knew and loved simply is no more, and that's very sad to me. Seeing a once phenomenal film talent slowly become worse at communicating story and constructing a compelling narrative and scene. It doesn't help that lead actress Elenia Pastorelli is as charismatic as a crate of dead fish. Add in some completely nonsensical scenes and an annoying kid, and this makes me want to plead with Argento to stop so we have more of his older films to enjoy and less newer efforts to endure. We're All Going to the World's Fair was released on April 15th, 2022, and is streaming on HBO Max. It's directed and written by Jane Schoenbrunn. I know a lot of people like this slow burn of we're all going to the World's Fair, but the lack of really anything going on made this more of an endurance test than a film for me. Yes, there is a scene or two where tensions go high, and I think that can be attributed to me wanting to see something happen rather than something actually occurring. The ending is a sobering one, one that is quite gruesome and disturbing, but I fear that this film may have ended in a way that is almost too subtle and too obtuse. 
the way it is left to one's own interpretation is all the more maddening. This one really just didn't hit me, and all of the hype behind it made it even worse in many ways, leaving me wondering what all the hubbub was all about. Dark Knight of the Scarecrow 2, aka Straw Eyes, was released on May 10th, 2022, and is streaming on Tubi. It's directed and written by J.D. Beagleson. This one left me asking, why, over and over. Why Sully one of the best made-for-TV horror movies with a no-budget remake? Why was this film made now, after 40 years has passed since the original aired? Why does this movie have an overcomplicated and confusing plot when the original was a simple, supernatural revenge flick? I'm a huge lover of low-budget cinema, but a low-budget rehash for a cash grab is something I just can't get behind. The writer of the original Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, J.D. Fugelson, returns only to highlight that the writing was not the strongest aspect of that original film. Sometimes the past should be left in the past. I'm glad this film is not an all-out remake, but this sequel should have been left out in the field with the crows. Dashcam was released on June 3rd, 2022, and is streaming on Hulu. It's directed by Rob Savage and written by Rob Savage, Gemma Hurley, and Jed Shepard. You don't have to make your lead likable, but you do have to make them relatable and at the very least tolerable for the extent of the movie. Lead actress Annie Hartley, who plays herself in the film, has had enough of with the pandemic and heads over to Europe to visit an old bandmate, and her irresponsible and chaotic behavior puts her in the path of a strange woman and a plot with supernatural and occult-like underpinnings. Everything is filmed via her dash cam, like the name of the movie. Annie fancies herself as a freestyle rapper and constantly broadcasts her lyrics and actions to her millions of followers. She's supposed to come off as brash, shocking, and witty, but in actuality, she is utterly unbearable to watch. I'm no prude, but her reliance on crude language and lack of any kind of compassion or concern for anyone but herself made her a painful person to follow for the duration of this film. She's not funny. She's not witty. She's not entertaining in the least. She's just a selfish, rude, and just plain dumb character. Writing this is making me mad all over again. I really hated this movie, and it was all because of Harley's excruciating performance. American Carnage was released on July 15th, 2022, and is streaming on Hulu. It's directed by Diego Halivas and written by Diego Halivas and Julio Halivas. Gah, this was a painful movie to endure. It's proof that Jenna Ortega is not impervious to making a bad film. American Carnage is an overpacked suitcase full of too many social issues, not enough resolutions to those issues, and absolutely ridiculous twists and turns. I don't want to give away too much of the story, but it involves stealing the energy from the young in order to supply eternal youth. This film attempts to tackle the crisis at the border, racism, homophobia, class warfare, and a handful of other issues without really giving a lot of thought about it past presenting these issues in the first place. Sure, these issues exist, but if all you have is a list of grievances, there's not much of a message or a story to work with here. On top of that, there's absolutely ridiculous logic going on where people age only half of their faces and bodies once they are sapped of their youth, leaving them looking like the Batman villain Two-Face. The film's greatest offense is that it simply ends without resolving anything. There's no resolution to the pickle the protagonists find themselves in, so the film simply ends on a one-note joke in a freeze-frame laugh. I kid you not, I, I couldn't believe how this film ended. This is one of the most painful movies I soldiered through this year, and I recommend you steer far away from this misguided adaptation to an already messy comic book. They Them was released on August 5th, 2022, and is streaming on Peacock. It's directed and written by John Logan. The fact that this is a story involving a killer at a gender recalibration camp involving all kinds of gender nonspecific characters is not the problem here. It's the fact that They Them acts as if it exists in a world where people don't know anything about the gender and pronoun issues in today's society. Yes, this film takes place somewhere in middle of America, but believe me, 
even in the middlest of the middle of this great country, people know about gender issues, pronoun usage, and all forms of topics concerning how the sex and gender one associates with affects one's everyday life. This film makes the assumption that its viewers and the antagonists are ignorant to any of the issues that are plastered on every news channel from CNN to Fox and everywhere in between these days, and proceeds to lecture us all just in case you don't know it. The broad stereotypes of the multi-gendered campers are so simplistic it's offensive. All they are is their gender choices. And if the acting is not over the top enough, the musical number midway will seal the deal that this is one unwatchable and misguided mess of a movie. Plus, for no reason, they kill a dog. This pathetic method of sympathy alone makes me hate every minute of this movie. This is a boneheaded film made by people who live in a world of persecution rather than the real one we can all relate to. It's just god-awful mystery-making and insurmountable preaching all the way through, centering on the most pretentious people possible. Avoid this one at all costs, no matter how you feel about gender issues. Good Night Mommy was released on September 16th, 2022, and is streaming on Amazon Prime. It's directed by Matt Sobel and written by Kyle Warren and adapted from the original film, written and directed by Severin, Fiala, and Veronica Franz. I'm going to use this remake of Good Night Mommy as the perfect example of why remaking effective foreign horror movies is a terrible idea. Lacking in any of the style and grace of the original unnerving story of a pair of twins dealing with their ailing mother, Good Night Mommy trades any of the palpable horrors of the original for the utterly predictable and uninspired. This remake lacks in any of the surreal landscapes or bizarre home designs that made the original such an unnerving experience. This lack of setting and any subtlety involving the plot undercuts any surprises that might have occurred in the twist ending. Naomi Watts delivers a lazy performance, and the design of her costume pales in comparison with the truly horrifying visage of the mother in the original. Add on a stupid and ham-fisted gun control message crammed in at the end, and you've got the main reason why American remakes of foreign horrors have the age-old history of sucking big donkey assholes. Jeepers Creepers Reborn was released on September 19th, 2022. It can be rented on Amazon Prime. It's directed by Timo Vorenzola and written by Sean Michael Argo. While it proudly announces that convicted pedophile Victor Salva is no longer part of the franchise, Jeepers Creepers Reborn proves that without him, the movie really lacks any kind of sense, direction, or purpose this series only remotely had to begin with. I'm not saying bring the guy back, but Timo Virenzola, the guy behind the Iron Sky franchise, is not the one who will give the Creeper a comeback. This reboot just never reaches the level of character and depth the first two achieved, so the human characters are not worth your interest. On top of that, the use of shoddy green screen and CG makes the Creeper look ridiculously cheap. Add on a very bad practical creeper mask that looks like it was bought at a Walgreens, and you've got one pitiful creeper. Plot points are sort of brought up, but lost in the nonsensical action, and this is another film that simply ends with a plop rather than any satisfying sense of resolution. Sure, bring in new history, and maybe even new powers for the creeper in the reboot, but how's about have it make some kind of sense to the story? Though another installment is most likely on its way, Hopefully someone with more creativity and skill will be behind the next one. The Monsters was released on September 29th, 2022, and is streaming on Netflix. It's directed and written by Rob Zombie. While it has its supporters, I just couldn't take Rob Zombie's version of The Monsters. It took me three tries to get through the whole thing, and even then I found my interest pulling me elsewhere. Constantly. Rob should have reached outside of his immediate friends list to cast Herman and Lily. His cast of usuals just don't have what it takes to make a mainstream style film. They work in smaller budgeters, maybe, but Sherry Moon and Jeff Daniel Phillips just can't carry this one. Zombie also needs to break down and admit his own faults and start working with a writer. He doesn't have the knack for comedy, at least not the kind of comedy that the original Monsters series was full of. Add to a narrative that goes all over the place and nowhere at the same time, and you've got a bad, bad movie. Plot points are brought up, dealt with quickly, and then forgotten. 
this was supposed to be a when Lily met Herman or origin story, but there's no challenge to get these two together at all. There's basically no kind of problem facing the monsters that doesn't get resolved easily and quickly. And there's no overall conflict to the story tying all the subplots together. It ends with a wet thump, and you've got a film that sits high atop Rob's mountain of bad films. I still root for Rob to turn out a winner every time his next one is announced, but man has this guy perfected the art of disappointing me. The movie, aka Renegade, was released on September 6th, 2022, and can be rented on Amazon Prime. It's directed and written by Michael Mandel. I usually don't like to pick on low-budget movies. They need all the support they can get, and usually I can find some kind of redeemable aspect about even the most inept examples of filmmaking. But the movie is simply torturous to sit through. It's about a failed filmmaker invading the home of an aging actress and forcing her to read his script and make his movie using his handheld camera. The plot is overused, but sure, I'll go with it. But the depths this movie goes is simply unforgivable. Midway through the film, the filmmaker adds in a love scene, simply because he wants to. The actress doesn't want to do it, so the filmmaker rapes her. Moments after the deed is done, the actress shockingly screams, You raped me! To which the filmmaker replies, No, I didn't. And then the story simply goes on to another topic from there. It's such a disgusting depiction of an awful deed, so deplorable that it made me almost stop watching. But yet I made it to the end, which was predictable from the get-go. It even has the nerve to end on some kind of profound note. There's nothing redeemable about the movie, and now that I've revisited this one, I plan on never mentioning or thinking about it ever again. House of Darkness was released on September 13th, 2022, and can be rented on Amazon Prime. It's directed and written by Neil LeBute. As a fan of Neil LeBute, even his laughable The Wicker Man, I was eager to see House of Darkness as it sported a strong leading cast of Kate Bosworth and Justin Long. Turns out even these two talented thespians couldn't help me muster any interest in House of Darkness. Touted as a sort of reimagining of Bram Stoker's Dracula, House of Darkness is only this if you squint tightly. What it is, is an hour and a half of sitting and talking about pretty much nothing at all. It's all the nervous small talk that occurs before sex, with no sex as the payoff. In the end, it tries to make some kind of feminist message about men saying whatever they can think of in order to have sex, but since, spoiler to no one, the gal is a vampire, isn't the lie she's holding back a tad bit bigger? This misguided logic permeates House of Darkness, trying to make Long's character despicable when he clearly is the most likable character of the bunch. A last-minute gore scene does not make up for the hour 30 I wasted watching this aimless turkey. The Butte is preaching again about the depravity of humanity, which is an ongoing theme in his stories, but this time, a lack of anything happening and circular conversations that lead nowhere make it his worst film to date. Finally, we have Halloween Ends. It was released on October 14th, 2022, and is streaming on Peacock. It's directed by David Gordon Green, and written by David Gordon Green, Danny McBride, Chris Bernier, Paul Brad Logan, and based on characters created by John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. I didn't want to save the most disappointing for the last, but since this list is going in chronological order by release date, it just so happens that Halloween Ends shows up at the end, and this is where it should be. Where to begin with this egotistical and misguided movie? How about deciding that even after hinting at some kind of big revelation to this series in Halloween Kills, the story instead veers away from that plot, cuts forward a few years, and decides to follow a brand new character. And while Corey Cunningham might have been an interesting protagonist to follow in his own movie that isn't called Halloween Kills, he is the glaring problem of this finale to one of the biggest slasher series of all times. Michael is the subplot in his own movie here, but that's okay, because the rest of the stars in this series, Lori and Allison, are right there with him taking a backseat to Killer Corey. The story attempts to bridge the transition between town pariah and pushover to ruthless killer, but fails to make that connection successfully. 
Corey's transformation never fully makes sense as he leaps from sympathetic misunderstood protagonist to bloodthirsty slasher in just a few underdeveloped scenes. Once the shape does show up in the third act, there's no tension or suspense built to make the conflict reach any kind of epic level it could have been. Seeing this play out shows that David Gordon Green and his crew had absolutely no plan into this trilogy once it was announced. Originally, it was supposed to be filmed all in one night. I would have loved to have seen that happen. Maybe then it would have worked, but the addition of Corey into the mix and simply adding nothing new to the Michael and Laurie relationship makes for one of the most disappointing installments of the Halloween series for me, and I'm even including the Rob Zombie Halloweens into that mix. At least Zombie incorporated the concept of another killer with much more style and panache in Halloween 2. This is David Gordon Green disrespecting the Halloween series, cashing in a paycheck, and giving the middle finger to the series' legions of fans who have stuck with the Halloween series through thick and thin. We deserved better. Well, that's my list of the most disappointing films of 2022. I honestly hate all of this negativity, but this list simply had to be made. Some of the offenses made by these movies are inexcusable, offensive, and simply bad representations of the horror genre. Tune in tomorrow for my list of the best horror movies released since after the deadline of my yearly countdown after October 1st, 2022. In the meantime, sound off about your least favorite horror movies of the year down in the comments. You're doomed to live the life you're meant to be. Stuck inside your reality Your doom Oh, your doom Your Yeah.